very warm welcome on behalf of Imperial College London to this very special event. My name is Peter Haynes. Uh, the screen behind me says that I'm the head of Department of Materials, which is true, but the reason that I stand before you at the moment is that I'm also the college's champion for high-performance computing. Uh, the mission of Imperial College London is to achieve enduring excellence in science, engineering, medicine, and business for the benefit of society. And high-performance computing has a critical role to play in underpinning our pioneering research, be that from computational fluid dynamics of jet engines to next-generation genome sequencing or simulating the plasmas in fusion uh, reactors to searching for new materials for sustainable technologies. And because of this wide-ranging uh, contribution to our research, the college invests very heavily in high-performance computing, making investments of £2 million per year in capital equipment alone. But far more significant than the facilities that we have is the combined expertise of the community of high-performance computing researchers in the college. Uh, and we recognise that in the past, HPC has been uh, a high-end niche activity, benefiting society through its contribution to high-tech innovations. But in the future, it's going to become pervasive. It's going to benefit all of us directly, uh, whether that's personalised healthcare plans, minimising travel delays, organising our shopping, or even perhaps accurately predicting election results. Uh, so... <laughs> This event today is about identifying and exploring those potential future opportunities based upon the experience and expertise of our research community at Imperial. I very much hope that you will enjoy not just listening, but also participating. So welcome again, and I'd like to introduce our facilitator for today, Peter Woodward. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, uh, and it's great to be with you. Yeah, I'm Peter Woodward. I'm an independent facilitator, and I spend my life being in, in rooms of amazing expert people like yourselves, enabling you to get the most benefit from a gathering like this, 150 or so people, all who have uh, expertise, passion, idea, thought, hope uh, around a specialist area like high-performance uh, computing. Uh, my main role this afternoon is to ensure that we get through what is a rich, interesting and varied agenda in a timely manner and also that we maybe are confronting the challenges of the future uh, with a smile. Uh, when I show you the agenda you won't smile because it's fairly packed full but just to give you a sense of the journey we're going through this afternoon, uh, it's slightly different from what's on here but that's the excitement about an ever-changing world. I blame Storm Doris. Uh, but what we're going to do in this room, we are going to really just think particularly about uh, some of the opportunities and challenges uh, presented by both the world and high-performance computing as a response uh, to finding solutions. We're then going to see some of the extraordinary emerging, actual and emerging research working uh, work taking place uh, in Imperial. We're going to have a chance to have a little bit of conversation about that, more of that later. We're then going to have a break, and then you have a choice of going into one of three um, uh, sort of breakout sessions where you're going to be able to explore some of your, maybe your particular interests, challenges, and all the rest of it a little bit uh, uh, in more detail. Then we're going to just pull it back together, and if you stay till the end, you get a nice drink of something and a T-shirt. Got to be worth it for the afternoon. So... That's the plan for the afternoon. I'm sure all the presentations are going to be available beyond today on various webby type things. Uh, and you'll find them with no problem at all. What I would like, sometimes we come to these, and there are quite a few presentations because there's some real information for you to get to grips with. But this is also a great opportunity maybe just to connect with old friends, new friends, people we never knew were going to be a friend. Um, and there's such a variety of people in this room. So what I'd like you to do is just for the three minutes, next three minutes, is to, is to rid yourselves of all your inhibitions and either look in front of you or behind you. Whoops, I pushed one too far. There we are. 
one behind, one in front, whatever. Just reach out and see whether you can say hello to someone you've never met before in your life and find out that you've got a new contact, contact to drive forwards. Off you go. Hi. Oh, right, great. Thank you for coming. Right, yeah. Okay. I'm mean, quite intrigued because Gerard here obviously does, um, and that's been very interesting. So it's the sort of thing you begin to ponder actually, whether, at, yeah, whether that would actually be a, a good thing, a good thing uh, to do. Because you know we we develop our own sort of entire house, and we're forever trying to pull to to the next generation. And, and, uh, so we have a team led by an HBC team led by a team by manager who at the moment is Matt Harden who sat at the back um, reports into HPC. So there's an interesting sort of thing where we have uh, a user panel that says this is what we need, a technical advisory group chaired by Gerard that says, well, that's how you're going to deliver that looking forward, <coughs> and then an HPC board that I chair that basically puts those together and says, okay, you know, and looks at a spend plan from the manager and says, right, okay, that, that works. Uh, well, so I mean, that's so kind of the... For Andy behind us, it's all about that. I mean, he's, our, well, he's your local salesman. He, yeah, I mean, know. it's... Yeah, I mean, it's so been in town. I'll, I'll leave that back to him. For as long as I can remember, you know. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, ten years ago. Three or four years ago, that would have been me. Okay. Okay. You're, you're here. You've got a yellow card. Wow, okay, <laughs> thank you. Maybe we just, let's scrap the presentations and just talk, eh? Um, just interested, anyone connected with anyone they've never met before in their life? There's something extraordinary that could happen in this room this afternoon. Um, uh, further on, anyone already made a connection with something, someone they think, that might be an interesting connection for the future? Okay, okay, so if you've made that connection, nurture it. If you haven't been successful, it's either because you're boring and uninteresting, or they are, or it just, you just didn't hit it off. But I'm hoping through the afternoon, you're going to be locked here for a little bit of a while, but at the coffee break and afterwards, please connect out. And we've got a refreshments at the end of the afternoon. See that as the most powerful opportunity for you to make connections. We always spring back and end up speaking to people we're familiar with. Don't use this opportunity to make new connections. That's the way we are going to uh, change our lives and hopefully change the world for the better. So, um, before we get on to some of the specific research and programs that are taking place uh, from those involved at Imperial, um, we thought it would be great just to really place some of that work within a context. Uh, and someone came up with a brilliant title for our keynote presentation. What do we need to do to solve the problems of the next 20 years? That's great as a title for a nice little talk. And we thought, hmm, who are we going to get to be able to offer us a solution to that? Well, we have the perfect person among us. Delighted that we are joined by Joseph Joe Curley, who uh, uh, serves Intel Corporation as Senior Director of Code Modernization Organization in Intel's Enterprise and Government Group. 
uh, a guy who's been talking about, thinking about, and evolving solutions around these areas for many years to offer maybe a thought, an overview, uh, overview, maybe some challenge, but maybe some promise, but certainly some thoughts to carry us through. Please welcome to the platform, Joe Curley. Well, I have to say, when I got the note to talk about the problems we need to solve for the next 20 years, my first reaction was, um, because if we hire futurists, we have, we have technologists, we, we have people that are paid uh, enormous sums of money to actually make those predictions. At Intel, we have to build fabri fab fabrication facilities eight, ten years ahead of having a product. So we have lots of people who are highly qualified to answer that question. Sadly, they got me. <laughs> and so, and, uh, how many, just a quick show of hands, how many people use are users of high-performance computing? Uh, and, um, and, and have had experience more than 10 years uh, in high-performance computing. Okay. So I also have the, the, um, the privilege of being relatively new to high-performance computing. Uh, I've been working it for about 10 years. And before I came into HPC, uh, what my impression of HPC was, was summed up in the number 42, which as everybody in this room knows quite well, is the answer to the question of life, the universe, and everything. And unfortunately, nobody understood the question. So it was an important answer to a question they didn't even understand that they spent the wealth of society to generate. That was my impression of high-performance computing. And I think that that is humorous, but so absolutely wrong. We, need to be, we, we, we should be using forums like this to find a way to, uh, to, to reshape the thought of what HPC is. Because the questions are extremely well known, and the answers are incredibly important. And I could spend uh, my entire time talking only about the case study of Hurricane Sandy and the European mid-range uh, weather uh, uh, forecasting facility. But the short story is we had a, a, a wind that uh, was even bigger than what we're about to experience here in London that caused $80 billion worth of damage to, the, to two states in the United States, New York and New Jersey. And it could have and, in fact, should have been a whole lot worse. Because of high-performance computing, and uh, a one weather model that seven days in advance, the only weather model that seven days in advance predicted that the storm would come in in Atlantic City, New Jersey, caused some emergency planners to start thinking that the other six models might be wrong and perhaps we might want to do something about this. By three days ahead, all of the models had converged and the cities of New York and Atlantic City, New Jersey knew they had a serious problem on their hands. They shut down, they had plans then to shut down all the subway tunnels, to close the stock market, and to do things to protect the power grid when the storm surge came in. $80 billion was trivial compared to what would have happened if the subways were running when that storm surge went into the tunnels. Imagine in the heart of winter shutting down the entire power grid of the northeastern United States for anywhere from one to seven days. Okay, high performance computing works on some big things. And this, this is what we know HPC is. We're solving global problems. We're protecting billions of dollars worth of investment. But actually, it also has, and I, I, I hadn't met Peter before, but he, he hit on so many of our themes right in the opening comment. It, it's about pervasive insight. Um, a few years ago, this is probably on the order of four years ago, Audi announced at International Supercomputing that they were building their automobiles without ever making a physical prototype. The prototype is entirely digital. We all know cars can be designed digitally. We knew they could be simulated because we've seen simulated wind tunnels. But now, the first car rolling off the line is the first physical Audi that has ever been seen. Well, okay, that's, that's quite interesting, but the impact of it was that by removing the, each physical prototype that cost millions to millions of dollars and six months to build, and another seven months for each interior design, they pulled anywhere from six to 13 months of development time out of a five-year cycle. That's competitive advantage in the marketplace. Now, I can't correlate specifically the breakthrough in high-performance computing to the recent success of the Audi brand in the marketplace, but it, it has actually occurred simultaneously. So something that, uh, that, something that used to be you know, a power that was reserved for national governments is now being used at a departmental level to fundamentally change industry in, in a very practical way. Uh, all, and, and all of those pictures, the photographs that you see of the part assemblies are all ray traced images, all generated by computers. Interestingly, all on CPUs. 
Uh, I'm an Intel salesman after all, I can say that. But the, but the point is, is that all of this was done on, on a commodity cluster like any one of you have. And it's because of the growth of performance. Now, this chart is taking everyone. I'm, I'm going to try to make stretch, uh, stretch um, from the macro to the micro for a moment. I'm, I simply wanted to be able to plot, looking back the last 10 years, the number 1, the number 10, the number 100, and the number 500 supercomputer on the planet. And if you look at the, the red line of the number one supercomputer, you see it's a bit jagged. Some trick machines that have broken through in new ways to do new problems. You see stair-step effects. But what's really shocking, if you look at the aggregate, the sum of all of the flops on the top 500, how smooth the transition is. And if you look at the number 100 and 500 machine, they just keep getting faster and faster. And this is exactly that, that pervasive technology trend that you heard in the opening comment. It's taking these cutting edge technologies, making them practical on relatively, on business size clusters and rolling them, in, and rolling them out for, so people can start to use them. And that trend line over, if, you, if, if, I, if I had enough room, I could uh, have extended it backward, I assert, will continue to move forward. And supercomputing is no longer reserved to a few superpowers or countries. Um, I, I, I'll quibble only with one comment from the opening remark. It already has become pervasive. And let me explain how. In 1997, the US government built the first trillion op floating point operation per second supercomputer at Sandia National Labs. It cost about, oh, about 55 a uh, million dollars, it, it took about 750 kilowatts to power it up. That same exact power can be done in a single microprocessor that was launched in 2012 for the cost of about a light bulb and a half. So sitting inside the desktop that you buy or whatever's running your kids' games or, or you know, any basically workstation, you have the power of what had been the first, uh, something, a, a superpower went off and spent 55 million dollars on. There are, tr there are tremendous implications to that. We shouldn't scoff at the power that sits inside our laptop. And we should really admire the power that sits inside our data center. So supercomputing has already become evasive, uh, pervasive, at least at a hardware level. Now, how are we using it? Well, we'll talk about that. A second thing that's changed, and uh, I'll try not to be, uh, in, in the recent spirit of politics, terribly jingoistic, but, um, but if you look only 10 years ago at, the, uh, at the, uh, the, the plot of who was playing in the supercomputing game among the top 500 known users of supercomputers, Europe in aggregate was about 18, 19% of the list. Today, it's about 20, 21. At one level, Europe is more or less consistent. But there has been a tidal shift from the United States to Japan and to China. Asia has moved on and is building tremendous assets in supercomputing. And, and, and realizing, taking a look at, at, at this as a laboratory. If you're going to start your, your businesses from scratch, if you're going to invent new processes, you take the latest tools, you build your applications upon them, and then you try to take the best state of the art, unencumbered by your past, and you build. And we're seeing it happen in an amazing shift globally. And I, and ju and I just decided to put you know, the flags of the number one supercomputer uh, in a trend line above to make a, a, make a, a point that there are people in this world that are very, very serious about HPC, and you should be too. Because if it is the laboratory of the future, if it is how cars or airplanes are designed, how oil is found, how stock markets are run, there will become a world of haves and have-nots. England industrialized and built, uh, built uh, an industrial empire. There is an information empire being built, and, and we can choose how we wish to participate in it. And another thing is changing. As a function of those machines getting bigger and bigger, new types of things can be done. I, I'd love to give this speech, and if you were to go up and Google online, uh, doctors Jonathan Cohen and Kai Lee from Princeton University, keynoting the uh, HPC developer conference right before supercomputing last year, gave a remarkable speech about neural sciences. Um, there's been a long, uh, a long running argument about how our brain works. And part of this is very interesting to Intel because we're trying to take how, what we can learn from the brain and bring it into how we design computers for the future. So this research had, uh, had both some interesting, uh, interest, interesting uh, both 
human as well as uh, industrial uh, applications. But what th there was a problem. What they wanted to do was to, to in, instead of modeling the human brain, which is something that here in Europe is trying to be done, it will take years and it will create a massive supercomputer to do it. What they wanted to do was build what they uh, modeled behaviors of the brain visually to try to see how things are happening. Well, what, the, what Kai and Jonathan ended up doing was they, they took the latest in machine learning techniques. So as data came streaming in from the, the MRI, they did quick computation upon it using regular HPC numerical methods and then applied a machine learning method to the data stream that's being done to update their model in real time to create a new model and then to re-simulate as the data came back in. And what was fascinating is that through the inference model that was created off of a big data approach, they were actually able to do two things. One, they took a problem that when they set out would have taken 44 years to simulate and they made it clinically able to be done from the fMRI in the laboratory in real time. It was a 10,000 time increase in performance, five orders of magnitude. And it was through new algorithms, parallel computing, and a little bit of new hardware. But it was all software. And what was most remarkable is that it actually generated a more accurate answer through inference than the numerical models that they had been working on. Faster, more accurate, clinically useful, and took a problem that couldn't be solved and brought it into something that can be used clinically. Uh, on, by the way, a relatively commodity rack of high-performance computing equipment. So it's insight. The, 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 the fact that that line is getting faster and faster and the computers are getting bigger and bigger is kind of interesting. And as a hardware vendor, it's incredibly interesting. I sell a lot of microprocessors. But to science and to business and to governments and to defense, it's changing everything. And the flood of data is not going to stop. Uh, and, and so I, I, the, um, our CEO used this uh, in an artificial intelligence day. I won't go through the whole slide. If you just look to the, the, the bottom slide, a digital factory, the sensors from a digital factory are going to generate roughly the amount of data daily that the number one supercomputer on the planet today can keep in its total capacity, about a petabyte of information. And this is going to happen within three years. Um, so we will, we will be swimming inside data. What was cool about Kai and Jonathan's problem is that the answer to the, the, how the brain was working came from the data. It didn't come purely through a numerical method. As you see more and more of the data getting out there, getting into computers, getting into large systems, it, 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 it causes you to think that behaviorally, from a social science standpoint, from predicting elections, the answers are in there if we, if we look for them and if we can develop the technologies to make it happen. Um, I won't belabor this point. Uh, Intel, Intel is heavily invested in trying to make these things happen. And we're, we're, we're working in all kinds of algorithms. We're working in multiple in methods of inference, of cognition, of, of numerical simulation. And we're doing it at the edge. Your cell phone, your cell phone's got a really remarkably powerful computer in it today, and it's only going to get more powerful. And in the cloud, through, through um, large-scale connected systems in the cloud, small-scale systems at sensors, where you can do things, you, we can imagine that the trip that I took that, uh, over from the strand to here that took about 40 minutes in traffic reasonably should have been done in 10 if only we could predict where all those cars needed to be and we could have timed the lights more intelligently to be able to move things around. The data is out there, the problems exist, and, and data-driven computing on top of numerical simulation creates enormous possibilities for us. The methods that we're talking about, in this case, generally speaking, uh, in, in, everybody's hearing and listening, and we're all talking about uh, machine artificial intelligence. Most of what people are talking about really is breakthroughs that people have been having in deep learning. It, it's much more complex than that. Um, but the, the, the algorithms for deep learning are, are about you know, 50 years old. I think the first big papers that I, I've read on this go back to about 1957. So why is this all happening now? Um, there, there, there are some interesting papers. Everyone, Moore's Law has died about 12 times uh, it, since, since I got into the industry. And it will die someday. Uh, it hasn't yet. Uh, and so Moore's law is a is a rule that says ru that roughly every two years the number of transistors inside a semiconductor double, 
And so uh, if, you, if you look this out, you'd end up with a curve that looks exactly like the transistor count that I've plotted out, which is every Intel microprocessor going back to about 19, the, the early 1970s. What hasn't increased is the other chart, which says that the frequency, laws of physics start to get in the way, how fast that individual microprocessor is, uh, starts to, uh, starts to um, flatten out. What that means is that performance, uh, and I'll give you a, a look at a couple of different microprocessors, one from about 11 years ago, one from about five years ago, and one from today. And what I've circled in yellow is a processor core. And if you look at the size of a processor core and you look at the amount of area a single core takes on a die, it, it, it clearly has shrunk. The, power, the performance of these systems come through parallelism. They come through parallel computing. Machine learning, deep learning in particular, are, are embarrassingly parallel problems that can use these many core processors that are now available at commodity prices to users. So we've got new technology that, that's able to, uh, to uh, uh, unlock a, a long-term problem. So for 20 years from now, we may be working in the same domains of science. We're still going to be looking for efficient energy. We're still going to try to understand the brain. We're still going to try to, to, to predict where disease will spread and how to cut it off. Those are things we've been working on for the last 20 years, but the methods that we use for solving those problems are likely going to change, and it's going to come through parallel computing. And if you haven't rebuilt your applications to actually take advantage, if your, process, if your application was built for a processor 11 years ago and you're buying the other one from us, just look how much of what you're buying from us you're using. So what? What, what this means is that um, the most important problem we're going to have to solve to solve the things you all work on on a daily basis is getting applications ready for these new kinds of machines in ways that will take the full advantage, that will unlock science. Um, two years ago at high performance at, uh, the, the, uh, at Intel's, uh, or the supercomputing conference, uh, Cambridge's Department of Advanced Math Mathematics and Theoretical Physics won the, the prize for big data computing from uh, HPC Wire. It was one of the nice awards that they give out at the, the event. What they were able to do was to take a commodity rack of hardware with some many core and multi core processors. And uh, the, mo the model and simulation they use for cosmic background radiation, they were able to uh, take that and build a model of the early universe. It was really quite, quite cool. The thing is, they couldn't actually do, before they started looking at their application, they couldn't run the application because it was 100 times, the data set was 100 times too big to fit in memory. And the compute times were too long to keep up with the stream of data coming from the satellite. For people that put their brand on, uh, on leading in the, un the understanding of cosmology, they couldn't have someone else with a different tool beat them to the market. So what they did is they sat down and looked at modernizing their applications. They actually achieved both the 100x increase in performance and 100 times less uh, data in the compute so that th they actually were able to, to, not, to do that and get published in the Journal of, Theor of Computational Physics and a few other really nice awards that came from it. But the difference between science and failure was writing a modern code to use modern hardware. And that, that requires a couple of things in trade-offs. It requires programmers. And uh, mo many of the computer science programs that are coming out today are teaching scripted languages, abstraction. Uh, you can get a CS degree in many schools in the United States and never understand the machine underneath it. Well, in one sense, that's good. It creates productivity. Abstraction is a wonderful thing. It, the productivity exists. Portability, you get some degree of that. Performance is a real problem. Um, and, and you may not be able to solve all of your problems with the performance you need if you don't have a programmer who can actually get to it. So when you put all that together, new algorithms, massive parallelism, new memory system technology, new system hierarchies, it's going to take something that breaks the last 50 years, the way I was trained uh, uh, to, to write programs, to actually use this. Now, I'll give a tip to some people here at Imperial College in London who are actually looking at how do you, how do you deliver both performance and productivity? How do you design systems that, that, user, that you can have varying degrees of expertise and, and get product, productive results? You may hear a bit more about that today, but what I really want to focus in on is this is the work item that you need to do for the computing for the next 20 years. We're going to build great hardware, and if we don't, somebody else will. 
but it's about making the breakthrough in science real on that hardware. Okay. Well, I've been given the, the I've been given the hook, and so before someone comes out and tells me I have to stop, I'll just say what we've been trying to do with it, and we've partnered with Imperial College here in London and with others to try to figure out how to solve these kinds of problems, how to build tools, how to train new programmers. We've tried to write all of this down. We get it published academically and through tools and tutorials. We try to, we, you know, we're, we come to places like this to inspire you to take a look at these problems and to join in our community. The efforts we're doing are to create open source, standards-based, portable, scalable codes to solve the problems of today and tomorrow. Mind you, that means it's not sticky to my hardware. I have to build great hardware to keep your business, but we'll take our chances with that. Um, all of that learning, we then try to recycle back into the community. So if you're up for it, and, and I think that if you're up for the problem of the next, your problem of the next 20 years, which could be anything from managing traffic to having a, 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 to just the absolutely perfect mint ice cream, they're all great benefits to humanity. Um, start working on this problem now. It's a parallel world. We've all known for years we needed to tackle the problem. Time is up. The clock has struck midnight, and now we have to do something about it. Thank you very much.